everyone, it's Holmes from Home Story Books and today I'm here with Maple Earl Grey Tea to talk to you about normalising queerness in fiction. Anna from Anna Reads uploaded a video where she talked about her body and other parties and how that collection normalised queerness in such a thoughtful way. Of course that book went way up my to read pile and I had to respond to her video. In it, she says she's frustrated with stories where characters are almost exactly like heterosexual couples, except that their genders are switched. And I have to say, I agree. There are, of course, heterosexual authors who write LGBTIQA characters wonderfully, and I will touch on some of those. And of course, LGBTIQA authors write those characters and stories beautifully but I want to get into the nitty gritty first. There are disappointments, and I think the disappointments lend themselves to a larger issue. The problem with making queerness normal is that if it isn't done well, it becomes what I'll call straight adjacent, which is a term I borrowed from a wonderful article, and I'll link that down below. In this context, I want to say that it assumes that queer people have all the same rights, practices, and are exactly like straight people, quote unquote. To say that queer people are exactly like straight people is to erase our struggle, our culture, and our relationships. It is to diminish, undermine, and underestimate our importance. It is something neoconservatives often do to claim we don't need safe spaces or bathrooms or special programs in schools. What I want to touch on in this video is this idea of queer respectability. The idea that someone will only respect me if I'm in a monogamous relationship, if I have a house, if I work, and if my queerness is not immediately a threat or an affront to any sensibilities. I think this is where a lot of polyamorous couples and also people with kinks encounter lots of issues and judgment. Ricardo J. Brown, in his autobiography, An Evening at Combs's, an autobiography about his time in a queer bar in a small town, talks about how strange a polyamorous couple are. They're alien and he doesn't talk to them. Why would he? He later acknowledges that he had prejudices of his own to challenge, and many of those came from the fact that they were polyamorous. Essentially what it boils down to is, you're allowed to be queer, but only if you're quietly queer, only if we don't actually know that you're queer, only if your queerness is invisible. It isn't a threat to my social standing or my femininity or masculinity. The West has maintained a vice-like grip on gender roles and gender identities, such that harmful colonial and white supremacist laws like Section 337 of the Indian Penal Code and Paragraph 175, active in Germany during the 1930s and until 1968, where the punishments were or are extreme and often deadly. But what if we didn't have that Western lens? I recently read and adored Johnny Appleseed by Joshua Whitehead, who is OG Cree First Nations from Pegwis First Nation, and he identifies as Two-Spirit. Johnny, the character in this story, is also Two-Spirit, and someone I cherish so much. His mother and grandmother accept his queerness without question, even from childhood. He goes to a school dance where he's quite young, and desperately wants to go as Minnie Mouse, but someone forces him to be Mickey. However, his grandmother makes him a beau, and he dances with a boy, he comes home gushing about it and how much he enjoyed himself. His stepfather then proceeds to beat him with a belt and tells him the boys don't dance with other boys, while his mother and grandmother are shouting at him to leave Johnny alone. Johnny is bullied mostly by the men in his life who believe in damaging colonial structures. There's a part of the book where Johnny asks if he can come to a sweat lodge and they respond yes, but dress modestly. Johnny wears a skirt down to his ankles and is told when he arrives, dress modestly. His grandmother stands up for him again, tearing this guy a new asshole. I get chills when I think of this scene because of what it represents. The women in Johnny's life are decolonizing these men every time they confront them, every time they allow Johnny to be exactly who he feels he wants to be. His mother's unconditional love and acceptance of him makes me tear up almost every time. It's so powerful to think of Johnny's existence as unquestioned, as sacred. Every time we think about this tokenistic normalizing queerness, we have to realize that we are doing so through a very colonial western lens. There are cultures that have been around for thousands of years that have always accepted queerness and always will. Certain individuals may not accept these traditions because of the damage done by colonial practices, 
schools and teaching, but that is not reflective of 60,000 plus years of history. That said, it is incredible how much damage can be done and how thorough the damage can be in so few years. With characters like Johnny and writers like Joshua Whitehead, they bring queer and two-spirit First Nations people back into the present. Whitehead, in his acknowledgments, says, They are not a was, they are a becoming. This book taught me so much. I first came out to my mother when I was 14. She warned me that people could be cruel, especially at school, and that if I was queer, I had to be careful with who I told, because if I ever decided I wasn't, it wouldn't matter, the damage would already be done, and I would be bullied for it. I took that very pragmatic warning to mean that I couldn't discuss queerness with her or come out as queer until I was 18. Then I was an adult, and my decisions would be my own. I realise many years later that she is very queer positive and now makes an effort to send me articles of LGBTIQA progress around the world and sends me photos of rainbows wherever she finds them. I realise now that we often watch films that featured queer characters, some notable ones including Four Weddings and a Funeral and In and Out with Kevin Klein, and I just didn't realise. If I'd grown up in a culture where queerness was normalised, even special, I would have come out to her much earlier, and we would have not had that moment of miscommunication that made me resolutely silent. It's not her fault, and I have to tell myself it's not mine, either. It just happened. But would it have happened if her current society viewed being LGBTIQA plus another way? I love my mum a lot, and I'm so, so grateful for her support, and she probably has no idea the effect that conversation had on me. When I did come out at 18, though, she hugged me and kissed me and said, that's fine, what did I want for dinner? Which is about as domestic and supportive as you can get, and I will never stop being grateful for that. Not for a minute. I think it's especially important to be critical of LGBTIQA plus representation now, because many people have so many rights they previously didn't have, so our relationships legally have much more standing than they ever had before. That doesn't make them the same. Many years ago, queer relationships were often non-monogamous, or people would have multiple partners or sexual partners because their relationships were hard to sustain, or they hooked up because they were at a queer party, and it wasn't often these parties were held or in a safe location. If you felt like you could be arrested for being queer the next day, I'd be smooching someone. Hold on, I'm gonna try my tea. Wish me luck. I think it's still really hot. But that doesn't mean we don't feel the same or fall in love the same way. I think Andre Ackman did an excellent job of writing queer relationships in Call Me By Your Name, which reminded me of what it felt like to be in the closet, to want to be with someone, to want to be them. I believe he identifies as heterosexual, but he seems to often write relationships and stories about desire that transcend lots of barriers, so I'd love to read more of his work, particularly Enigma Variations, where he has lots of characters struggling through love and sex and everything else. Wandering Sun by Takako Shimura is another example of work that I can think of where, although the author doesn't expressly identify as LGBTIQA+, Shimura does a masterful job of bringing two trans characters to life. These two trans characters, Mitori Shuichi and Yoshino Takatsuki, are both trans elementary slash middle schoolers and they become friends and support each other. I love the tone of these graphic novels, I love how high the stakes are, and I love that Shimura really takes these children and their concerns seriously. I've also done a video on this, and I'll link that down below, that talks about books with unexpected queer themes or characters. Many of these authors don't identify as LGBTIQA+, I believe, and I don't want to out people, but have incorporated queer characters or themes into their books. A lot of authors would say, and as an aspiring author, I heartily agree that it's the characters that lead you, or there is no other way the character could be, but it's still a stylistic choice that I'm very grateful for, because a lot of other times we get very pointed refusals in media. It happens a lot, particularly in video games and Marvel and Disney franchises, where heterosexual relationships are rammed in where they would otherwise be useless to the storyline and do nothing for the chemistry or character arcs. It's so interesting that so many writers and producers and executives seem to think that by having someone kiss someone of the opposite gender, they've confirmed their sexuality. As if bisexuality doesn't exist. As if people's sexualities can't change. 
as if within all these fantasy worlds it's unbelievable that anyone would want to be anything but heterosexual. There seems to be a middle ground where lots of directors, writers, authors and other creators will say we're going to leave it open. It's open to the audience's interpretation and whatever meaning you take from it is your own. This is great and means that we get lots of fun questions during comic cons, press conferences and other events from authors, actors and directors. However, it means that LGBTIQA plus people, characters and moments are regulated to be purely speculative. The message I get when I hear things like this is, that's nice but it's not important enough to write it into the story. So LGBTIQA plus people and our allies are left to their own devices to create webcomics, fanfiction and pastiches sometimes better than the source material. A lot of the time, there are representations of queerness, bisexuality, and the LGBTIQA plus experience, but they end up on the cutting room floor, as in the case of Black Panther. There is one exception to this rule of heterosexuality that I can think of, and it is The Legend of Korra. If you haven't seen it, I don't want to spoil it. I'll put a little indicator up when I'm talking about it, and I'll take it off when I'm done. Legend of Korra is about Korra, a young, headstrong girl who is the master of all the elements of the world, earth, fire, wind, and water. She is a woman of colour, specifically First Nations, and it's about her making friends, mastering her powers, and dealing with some world-ending drama. At the end of the show, she falls in love with a young woman named Asami Sato, who is Japanese-American in this interpretation of the world, and runs her own company in the vein of Tony Stark's Stark Industries, the creator of the show, Brian Konietzko and Michael Dante DiMartino, were told by Nickelodeon that their show would be cancelled at the end of its current season and decided they had nothing to lose. Brian Konietzko, in an interview after the finale, discloses, however, we still operated under this notion, another unwritten rule, that we would not be allowed to depict that in our show. So we alluded to it throughout the second half of the series, working in this idea that their trajectory could be heading towards a romance. But as we got close to finishing the finale, the thought struck me. How do I know we can't openly depict that? No one ever explicitly said so. It was just another assumption based on a paradigm that marginalises non-heterosexual people. If we want to see that paradigm evolve, we should take a stand against it. And I didn't want to look back in 20 years and think, man, we should have fought harder for that. Mike and I talked it over and decided it was important to be unambiguous about the intended relationship. He talks about working with Jeremy Zuckerman to create a very romantic song for the finale. And let me tell you, as a pan bi woman, as someone who was starved for thoughtful, realistic queer representation as a child, Legend of Korra and its finale meant the world to me. I watched it with my wife in Canada and we cried happy tears. When I left to go home back to Australia and to continue studying, I had a 12 hour layover in LAX. That song from the finale was the one I listened to over and over, over those 12 hours and then again over a 12 hour flight back to Brisbane. That song and that ending told me that my story could end happily and I spent that layover and that flight reminding myself of that. I could keep talking, but so many of my thoughts in this one video could be a totally separate video in and of themselves. I'd love to do a video on the history of lesbian pulp fiction, how it has a revival and its legacy, how my own discomfort with half-baked LGBTIQA representations changed, how I viewed queer media, and so on. We are a seriously varied group. I won't be finished talking about representation and normalization until we're all equal. There is a serious lack of positive trans representation, constantly focusing on transitions, genitals, and other body parts, which seems to be a reflection of a rigid gender binary. But the point of this video, if you've made it this far, I want normalization not in the sense that it must be equivalent to straightness but normalization in the sense of allowing LGBTIQA characters to exist peacefully in stories. I want us to have stories that end in things other than death and unrequited love. I want us to be heroes as well as villains. I want stories that touch every corner of the LGBTIQA experience. And those stories start with Audre Lorde, James Baldwin, Billy Ray Belcourt, Tommy Pico, Janet Mock, 
Ali Smith, Alice Walker, Anne Bannon, Vivek Shreya, Sappho, Ivan Coyote, Gwen Benoit, Dennis Smith, Valerie Taylor, Juno Dawson, and Julie Morrow. Those are just the names off the top of my head. This is just the beginning. I'm going to have my cake, and I'm going to eat it too. Thank you so much for watching, and thank you so much to Anna for making such a wonderful video. I'll talk to you soon. Bye, everyone. Oh,